Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Hello, and welcome to episode 211 of APM Success. This is part two in a series what I would call a criminally abbreviated series on a complex tax topic about medical practice transactions. I'm here with my friend Evgeny Ivanov, who's a CPA who does a lot of healthcare tax work. And uh, he, with me, are going to unpack today talking about the difference between a stock sale and an asset sale and why you need to know uh, some of the important moving parts here. So Evgeny, welcome. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having me again. Um, so Evgeny and I were talking before, um, (laughs) before going live here and what we concluded is if we're going to keep this into a palatable length for you, dear listener, we're going to just necessarily leave out many, many important things. So the main thing I want you to take away from this episode, if you get nothing else, here it is. The differences between an asset sale and a stock sale are significant in two different categories. Number one is for tax treatment of the transaction, which many CPAs are going to immediately zoom in on. And if you're talking to a CPA about either an acquisition or a sale of a medical practice, they're going to say, okay, here's the way I understand it in terms of tax treatment, which is all well and good, but that's only 50% of the equation. And sometimes, frankly, less than 50%. The other component is the operational continuity of the entity. And specifically, there's a lot of reasons that this is relevant, but one of the most immediately apparent has to do with the rates negotiated with payers for the different procedures. So we'll talk, we'll use a pain practice succession as an example for today. So the, uh, the entity as it exists, the, the current LLC, if it is an LLC or PLLC, it's going to have negotiated rates for all the different procedures with all the different payers. Those rates continue to persist as long as the entity continues to persist. So the asset sale versus stock sale question is very relevant for the preservation of those rates to the extent that it's important. So if you're buying a practice and you want the rates negotiated by this older physician who got great rates back in 1993 and, you know, or is part of this uh, consortium that has done well with negotiating in the past, you've got to understand that. We're not just talking about taxes. We're talking about taxes plus operations and reimbursement. So with that caveat, you want to make sure that your CPA is looking at both. And I'm here with Evgeny to talk about some of the key differences between these with the understanding that this is only the beginning of the discussion. So Evgeny, for starters, can you just give us a brief description of the asset sale versus the stock sale? And what are we talking about here? Okay, Justin. So let's start with the tax question as most CPAs are thinking about tax. What asset sale means is selling your asset. And now what are assets? It's the simple example of assets will be your equipment, your furniture, anything tangible that you own, and it, it could be intangible also. So that that's selling those those assets has different tax implications compared to selling your stock. And what what happens with the sale of assets for tax purposes will be the the depreciation that has been taken will be recaptured or will be taxed at an ordinary rate and then any difference will be at the capital gain rate. So there's different rates of taxes depending on depreciation taken before. That's an asset sale. With a stock sale, you're basically selling your company. You're selling the stock. Now, in the old days, you would have the certificate of stock. You grab it and you sell it to the new to the to the buyer. When you do that, it's all it's just the same as selling stock on the stock market. Apple stock, for example, you you buy and you sell, and it's the same treatment. Capital gain raised depending on your bracket, 20 percent. That is the tax difference of the sale. And now let me go back a little bit. When you sell the assets, you still own your company. 
when you sell the stock, you don't own the company anymore. So that's another difference. You may need to file some final tax returns if you want to close it when you sell the assets or keep it open for a little while while you collect your receivables. And that, that is the tax aspect. And as Justin mentioned, tax is not the only game in town. And when you sell a practice, there's you have these contracts and various other reasons that might be there that are not, not tax that can direct your deal towards stock or, or an asset sale. So let's and, pause here for a minute and just sort of zoom in on this. So for the asset sale, you're selling your stuff. Your stuff are tangible and intangible assets. The tangible assets are the hardware, the C-arm, the exam tables, the furniture, all the things in the building where you are conducting your medical practice. Uh, the Also the intangible. So usually the intangible value is the, the goodwill is what we would call it, meaning the mm -hmm. reputation in the community that a practice has achieved. Um, ABC Spine and Pain on Main Street. Um, the intellectual property associated with that brand is uh, an intangible asset. The, the, the things that people say about it whenever they talk about that practice, that is also part the, of the deal. The patient list is one of those assets yes. too. Yes, yes. Which, um, in, let, yeah, I'll interrupt you. In most practices, the intangibles like that, the, the, the goodwill, as we called it, with the patient list and how the society uh, perceives you, that's most of the value when you think about it because we're, the physicians we are in the business of providing services. Now, if this was a manufacturing company, chances are the actual tangible assets, equipment and furniture will be more than the intangible, but in a service business, the intangibles are more than the tangible uh, equipment. Which is which is good because the, now I'll go back to the taxes. When you sell intangibles, usually it's treated as a capital gain, so you get the same tax rates as if selling selling stock. So the, when you negotiate your price, you want to assign more to the intangible assets like uh, goodwill. And so for the seller, when you sell an asset, when you, when you do a sale in an asset sale. You mentioned depreciation recapture. So when you've got all this stuff, you've got your C-arm, you've got your exam tables, you've got all these things. And each year, we'll, we'll, we'll exclude like the immediate total depreciation in your one circumstances for a moment. But each year, if you buy a piece of heavy equipment for $100,000, you're going to write off an expense over time. You don't expense the whole 100 in year one. You're going to write off 20000 and then 20000 and then 20000 over successive tax years. So that is an expense that reduces your taxable income. But in an asset sale, if you're the seller, you're selling all the stuff, you've taken depreciation on the stuff, there's a recapture of that tax benefit that you have claimed over time. I am I properly explaining that, Evgeny? Yes, so the, here's the logic. When you expense the depreciation, that is an expense that saves you tax at your ordinary rate not at capital gain rates. And the IRS is saying, well, now when you sell it, we're not going to let you pay tax on that amount of gain at the capital gain. You have to basically pay the same amount. And we're focusing on the seller right now. So the buyer will have different reasons that maybe we can touch later. So that, that's the IRS's logic or to make you pay tax on the depreciate, depreciation taken at the ordinary rate. And so for the seller... Doing an asset sale rather than an asset sale election rather than a stock sale has this significant tax disadvantage. So, as you're in discussions with a potential seller, understanding the seller's motive and rationale in that circumstance is a it's a useful thing to get your brain wrapped around from a tax standpoint. Here's the the thing about medical practices that is unique. If you're buying a medical practice. Uh, in any other business or in many other businesses, um, if you're a buyer, buying the asset rather than the stock makes a lot of sense. And tax rationale in this transaction is so dominant. It's the most important thing by a long shot. And there are few other considerations that would make a stock sale uh, beneficial in general. Um, 
in medical practices, because of the nature of practice having a tax ID that negotiates rates with different payers for different procedures, that's linked to that tax ID, it's linked to that entity, that is an operational consideration that because the revenue, <laughs> the money that this business can make is so inextricably intertwined with what those rates are, those contracted rates, if you do the asset purchase, you're getting a good deal as a buyer from a tax standpoint, but you're sacrificing what is perhaps the most important asset, which is these contracts that are not going to migrate because they're attached to the tax ID. So it's, it's more of a technical operational consideration. So if you did this, hypothetically speaking, if you did the asset purchase, you're a buyer of a medical practice, you go into ABC Spine and Pain, you do the asset purchase, you buy all the exam tables and the C-arm and everything else and the patient lists, you form your new entity, um, you have all the stuff, but that old practice perhaps was getting 140% of Medicare <laughs> as a blended rate from their commercial payers for the procedures that they were doing. And you, as a brand new and practice physician, you've got your new LLC or PLLC or whatever entity structure you're using. Um, you now have to go to Blue Cross, go to Aetna, Cigna, Anthem, and all their friends and say, here's the rate that I want. And they're going to tell you, that's not the rate you're getting. We're going to give you a fraction of Medicare. And all of a sudden, the practice that was operating at a, a nice margin with significant revenues because of those rates, the economics of the purchase are totally different. So the considerations on the operational side, on the contract side in particular, are one reason to say, I don't actually want to do an asset sale as a buyer, where normally I would, I want to do a stock sale. So um, let's talk for a minute about the, this, how a stock sale differs from a tax standpoint. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the operations. So Evgeny, talk us through, you know, we understand the recapture from the seller. If you're a seller and you're selling your assets, you're paying back some of the tax benefit that's been accumulated over the years. If you're selling an entity as a stock sale, how does that work from a tax standpoint? Yeah, if you're selling, if you're the seller and you're selling the stock, you're basically selling your company to the buyer. So you're grabbing your certificate and you're bringing it to the buyer and they pay you cash for it. That way, you, you, you're not controlling the company anymore at that point. The buyer is. So the buyer takes over as the owner of the company. And if it's an S-Corp, the K-1 switches from you to, to him or her. The treatment is capital gains. Depending on your income, it could be 15 or 20%. And your basis is basically your basis in stock, not not has nothing to do with the assets at that point, and that's it. And if you're the, uh, I don't know, we can touch on the on the buyer later, but that's basically what happens with the seller in a couple of sentences. So from the seller standpoint, selling stock uh, has the capital gains treatment, which is lower than the ordinary income uh, tax rates. Which, from a tax standpoint, for the seller, this is what makes the stock sale attractive. That's right. And you don't have to deal with winding down the entity, filing some final tax returns. You know, that's that's an additional castle, if you want to call it, after you sell. You just want to sell, collect your money, and let's say retire or do something else. So from the seller's perspective, selling the stock makes more sense. If you look at taxes, <laughs> but if there's other aspects going into it, yeah, you have to look at everything else, not just taxes. Can you maybe give us a an A and B example of a, a similarly structured deal with an asset sale and a stock sale? They both have the same sale price and show us the net proceeds to the seller just with a very sort of, you know, crayon on a napkin kind of way. The tax impact of a seller selling as an asset for $2 million and the tax impact of a seller selling as a stock for $2 million. Okay, let's see if we can do this in, uh, in our heads without using pen and paper or any electronics here. So $2 million selling price, let's say the basis 
in both cases is a million dollars. And what basis means is that's how much is not taxable. So that the actual gain is a million dollars. I'll start with the stock. A million dollars, you sell your stock and we'll focus only on federal taxes here because each state is different as well. And we also assume you're in the 20% bracket for capital gain. So a million dollar gain, 20% tax, you pay $200,000 in tax and that's it. Now let's go to the asset sale and we'll make it the worst case scenario. And we'll assume that all of the, the assets were tangible. There's no goodwill. So we, can, uh, we don't have to deal with the different rates there. So a million dollars gain. And let's assume that those assets had all fully depreciated. That's, that's the easiest way I can calculate in my head. Mm -hmm. If it's all fully depreciated, a million dollar gain is taxed at the ordinary rate and the highest rate is 37%, which means $370,000 in tax. So right there, you have $170,000 net cash difference. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this calculation will be more complicated when you have not all of the gain being associated with the depreciated assets and when you add the goodwill to that that will change and it will get closer and closer to the capital gain tax but this is the worst case scenario we'll wrap it up there i think this has been an effective commencement for our listeners to say if i'm selling an entity or if i'm buying into an entity understanding the stock versus asset treatment of the thing that i'm buying is really important so Talking to your CPA, yes, definitely do that, but also talk to somebody who understands operationally how medical practices work and that the maintenance of contracts in some cases can be important depending on how good they are and what kind of rates you may be able to negotiate in a new um, entity. So Evgeny, thank you for joining us today and helping us tackle a somewhat thorny topic. Look forward to having you back on the show again sometime before long. Thanks, Justin. Thanks and have a great day. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com, where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.